In 2013, a low-budget movie came out called Begin Again. It told the story of Dan Mulligan, who was down in his luck A&R man, who stumbled into a bar in New York to drink away his regrets, only to discover that it was an open mic night. And on the stage, Greta James, somebody that he didn't know, a young woman was up singing a song with her acoustic guitar. And something special happened in that moment. This is how the scene plays out. So you find yourself at the subway With your world in the back by your side And all at once it seemed like a good way You realize it's the end of the line For what it's worth It's a great little movie, it's well worth watching if you haven't seen it already. But there's something that's happening in that bar that is quite interesting to me. Dan is having an experience that nobody else is having. Now, the director helps us to see and understand this by quite literally getting the instruments to play themselves. Because in that moment, Dan alone in the room is hearing what others can't. He can hear the full band, he can hear it all come together. And that's why he has an experience unlike anybody else in that room. Now, you might wonder why it is that we're talking about something like this whenever I should be talking about GIS, but the clue maybe is in that message on the screen. I wonder, are you ahead of me where we're going to go? We're not talking so much about hearing what others can't, but we're talking about being able to see what others can't. And that is the bold claim that um, Esri, the company that makes ArcGIS, for instance, makes, enables you to see what others can't. In fact, Mark Enzer, the geography teacher from England, talks about this as being geography's superpower, our ability to see things that other people can't see. And it is amazing whenever we're sitting and looking at a landscape, just how much of that comes through. In fact, I think there should be a rule. I think there should be some kind of law that any time that a geography teacher gets on an airplane, that we should have automatic right to the window seat. I don't know if you're like me, if you don't end up getting the window seat and you see the person in the room in front of you get in at the window seat and just before take off, or just after the plane's taken off, they close the blind. They close the blind. That lovely view, and they close the blind. Don't they know there are meanders out there to feast their eyes on? Don't they know there are even oxbow lakes for you to be able to look down and go, oh my goodness, look at what's down there. I think there should definitely be a rule the geography teachers should have the view out the window. Because when we look out the window, we see things that others can't. So I'm going to share with you now a photograph that I took out of an airplane window a couple of summers ago as I flew into Tenerife. Now, I want you here to have a look and see what you can see. I want you to notice what you see in that landscape. Others would just look out and see a beautiful island. But what are you seeing 
you're seeing the topography, aren't you? The shape of the land. You're seeing those deeply incised V-shaped valleys. You're seeing uh, how the uh, drainage pattern has caused that significant erosion in the way down. You're seeing here to the top right, the cloud coming in. You're maybe making some assumptions about prevailing wind there, that perhaps the northern side of the islands get more cloud and rain than the southern. You're probably making some assumptions then about what the vegetation will be like. Down here to the bottom left, you're noticing the scale of this because you're seeing a little boat. You're getting a sense of just how big this island is. And Follow that on up and you see some evidence of human settlements. You can see some green there and far in the background you can actually see the airport. Not the airport that you're going to land on, but the airport nonetheless. And what we can do whenever we look at a landscape like this as a geographer is to place conceptualized layers onto the landscape itself. We see what others can't. Peter Jackson in uh, a seminal and very important article in the Geography magazine in, in I think about 2007 said this, thinking geographically provides a language, a set of concepts and ideas that can help us see the connections between places and the scales that others frequently miss. That's why we should focus on geography's grammar as well as its endless vocabulary. He say he was talking about the vocabulary being things like place names, but the grammar being the theories and the concepts. And that, he said, is the power of thinking geographically. We take these conceptualized layers and we place them onto the landscape. And I think that that is very much at the heart of what it means to think geographically. So how does this relate to GIS? Well, I, I think this uh, sense of conceptual layers is very analogous to GIS because what it does is turns the conceptual layers into literal layers. It's a way of managing and manipulating the uh, vast array of information to turn the complexity into clarity through the use of those uh, literal layers. So let's go using the power of GIS to that place that we've just been visiting. There is that very landscape looking out from the window of the plain, La Gomera. You can see the steep sided valleys. You can see the drainage patterns. You can see the settlement. You can see the runway. But we don't just place um, metaphorical layers on here, conceptualized layers. We can literally turn on the layers. This is a volcanic island. Wouldn't it be interesting to see what the geology of it is like? That's no problem. We can turn on a layer. And we notice that there's a, a bit of a pattern here to the geology. I wonder what it's like when we go down here. Um, differences in the geology. I wonder how that relates to the settlement patterns there. Where are the settlements found? Or maybe it's better for us to zoom out to a different scale and see where the settlements are in totality here. And we can see that most of them are small settlements scattered around, but there is a large settlement here. Now, why is it over here? Well, we zoom out a little bit further. We see, oh, that's proximity to Tenerife. This is a small island to be able to go from Tenerife across here or from Lagomera to Tenerife is, is a good thing um, to use the services and so forth there. But let's come back into Lagomera a little bit more. Let's look in more specific detail about how these settlements are located around here. Is there a pattern to these settlements? Well, uh, I wonder how they relate to the road network. And um, this is a particularly challenging um, landscape here. The roads can't just go anywhere. There's particular places where they need to go and we can absolutely see that there's a relationship between the roads and where the settlements are. In fact, if we zoom in a little bit closer, we're able to see that the, the roads are following up through the valley bottoms or zigzagging along the ridges and that's where the settlements tend to be. So what we're able to do with the GIS is to take those conceptual layers that we have just been considering as we look out of the airplane and we can turn them into literal layers, those layers and many, many more. And we can start to see that uh, set of relationships and patterns that exist in this landscape that we will encourage to look at. So why should we study GIS? I guess I would take a step back and ask a more fundamental question. Why do we study geography? And the answer, at least in part, is so that we can see the world better. So why GIS? Because that seeing better is enhanced by GIS. GIS enables us to do geography better, and that's why it matters. 
In a moment, we're going to go on to take a look at some examples of how we've been integrating GIS into the teaching of geography in Lurton College. But just before we do that, I want to take a few moments to consider just a little bit of theoretical underpinning for the actions in, uh, that we've been doing. Because I think if we get our planning right, we're much more likely to get our implementation right. And I think that these three um, categories of knowledges that we're going to look at will help with that planning. The first of them is the know why. This is your pedagogical intent. Just like would be the case with any use of ICT and ed tech within your school, we start with the pedagogical question. What is it in terms of the geography that we want our students to know, understand or be able to do? But very often what happens once we get that clear in our mind is that we move into the know how, the procedural knowledge. Tell me how to do this. That's really not what I'm going to be focusing on here today, actually. I'm going to be covering a third category of knowledge that I would call know what. This is what I would categorize as functional knowledge. This is what you can reasonably expect the GIS to help you to do in terms of your pedagogical goals. Because I think it's the dialogue between the know why and the know what that really helps with the planning. And whenever you get that clear in your mind, if you know what it is that you can do, then there's always ways that you can find out the how, the procedural knowledge. So I'm going to be focusing more on the know why and the know what. It's kind of like this. Anytime you want to cook, particularly if, like me, you're not a particularly natural cook, you're going to need to follow through step by step. This is like your procedural knowledge, your know-how. But cookbooks are always very clever, of course, because just in case you get put off by there's far too many instructions there, they show you this picture, the know-what, what is the end result going to be, and that motivates you to dig in to all of that know-why because you know this is coming. So it's the conversation between the know why and the know what that we're really going to be focusing on here as we go in and take a look now at some of the examples of what we've been doing. One of the core elements that is part and parcel of the teaching of geography is case studies. Um, and part of the challenge we have with case studies is to turn space into place. Now, as I'm sure you'll know, place is space plus meaning plus sense of interpretation with it and part of the challenge i think particularly if we take a look at the ccea uh, extreme weather event case study you've only got to look at the impacts impacts on people and impacts on people this is typhoon haiyan in the philippines but i can write a statement like this in their notes most of the deaths occurred as a result of the unprecedented six meter storm surge that swept across the coastal plain up to one kilometer inland and my students can sit down and learn that, they can repeat that in the exam, but what have they really learnt about this place? It's far too easy for a statement like that to be very, very decontextualised. So this is where GIS can come in. Uh, it's a way of really turning place or space into place for them. So this is their investigation of Typhoon Haiyan. We start with the overview just to let them see where it is in the world that you're getting these tropical storms, same storms, different names, different locations. Then we can come in a little bit closer to um, this one and we can turn on the Typhoon Haiyan points. We can pull in some data and I can get them to go in there and find out when it was that it, it started to become a typhoon category. They can get the categories from these. So they're beginning to get this sense of the typhoon coming in towards the Philippines. And then we can go in a little bit further again. We can come in here and I can turn on the satellite image and they can get a sense of the size of that um, storm. And they can use the measure tools again. Here we are here, just go from there to there, get a sense of the size of that uh, 1700 kilometers across. But we can go in even further again, because what about that storm surge that we were talking about? If I turn on this layer of the storm surge damage, and I turn on the legend, um, sorry, let me go to this one, sorry, storm surge damage, and turn on the legend, um, I can get them to explore the following hypothesis, or the following idea, um, as distance from the centre of the typhoon increases, the damage decreases and they can use this key to get a little bit of a sense of that. But we can go in further again to the island um, that was most particularly badly damaged by that and then we can put on some more information about the storm surge here. These are symbols that show the height 
of the storm surge in meters and again you could look at the relationship between distance from the center of the storm and the height of the storm surge and you can click on here and get values 3.6 meters here up here it's dropped down to 1.8 meters definitely getting smaller up here it is 1.8 meters as well but your eye will be drawn here won't they this one is 4.6 meters so far away how far away well of course they could always do the measure tool couldn't they so we're over 200 kilometers away and the height of the storm surge there is 4.6 meters now this is where the powerful geography can kick in because why why what's going on there and this is the power of the gis because you can unleash the ability to go and explore now they might need a little bit of guidance in that one from you as a teacher but surely part of your explanation could be that the shape here of this area it's a bay shape so as the waves are, f are come across here they are funneled in and the height of the storm surge goes up at that point but they are able to go and have a look and get a real sense of that and then of course we can go into Tacloban city itself which is mentioned in the case study and I'll just turn off the storm surge and the key here is showing you the buildings that are damaged and the collapsed you can get them to look at the pattern there you can get them to see where most of the red things are and where most of the yellow buildings are you can get them to relate that to the height there are the contour lines there as height begins to increase and there's a valley coming through there that ridge and um, there is isn't it badly as badly affected yeah, they can explore all of those things and of course this being a GIS map I mean they can literally explore they can go in and have a closer look at those things um, but you can get them to go in really really close to this area and you can start to come down to a really fine grain building by building analysis of what's going on and um, you can get them to measure tool again and you discover that it's within that hundred meters of the coastline in particular all of those buildings right next to it were destroyed now when I designed this task first of all I used it with my year 13 so also use it with the year 11s um, I got them to look at the distance from the shore um, and the damage or destroyed buildings but one of my year 13 boys said to me Mr Hamill I'm just noticing here that these buildings near the coast is there, is there something in relation to the building size um, and the damage that was caused I hadn't even realized that or recognized or noticed that when I was designing the task but unleashing them and giving them control of it enabled that powerful geography to come in for my students themselves to notice this and we went on to Google Earth at that point went and stood in this street here Esperas um, Avenue and we realized of course these are some more of your shanty towns the very very vulnerable buildings these buildings are bigger more robust and therefore they weren't being damaged as much or they weren't being destroyed as much either badly damaged yes but not destroyed as much but that was a real light bulb moment for me in terms of giving my students the freedom to explore this and to go from that really fine grained um, all the way from that overview and to get that real sense of scale now I did this exercise with them whenever they were in lockdown as well um, and when they were learning from home uh, which is maybe a brave thing to do um, you can I can ask me later in the questions about how exactly I designed that but I managed to guide them through and I got some feedback from the year 11s about how they got on some really interesting feedback here in terms of the engagement they really enjoyed it now don't knock it uh, when they're sitting at home struggling with motivation during lockdown for me to get feedback from my students that was really fun I love the map work but the engagement can't be the argument alone there's got to be good geography from this and they've also got to make be able to be able to do this so what about that know-how I didn't say I wouldn't talk much about this but I suppose there's the know-how in two different categories or senses there's the know-how in terms of how you would put together what I've just shown you that and, and <laughs> I'm not telling you today I, I don't have the time but the know-how of how to use it which is an interesting know-how because I was my able oh, I was able to give this exercise to students during lockdown and I'm getting statements like this it was very easy to use and it has been my experience that with a little bit of minimal guidance the students can access this GIS technology and software really readily the statement here um, using the GIS at home was hard at first yeah some of them find it a little bit more difficult but with the support look at what they've said I soon got the hang of it it was quite fun using the different tools to measure the area and the distance
But what about the powerful knowledge? I love these statements. It was good to see the path of the typhoon in real life map to get a, an idea of the extent of the damage it caused. I enjoyed measuring the areas of damage and the size of the typhoon because it allowed you to see how devastating these typhoons can be. It allowed you to see what they would otherwise not have seen. That compared to that. Hmm. I enjoyed using the measuring tool because it put things into scale. Now again, I can say here, six meter storm surge uh, up to one kilometers inland. But does that really mean anything to them? Versus this, it puts things into scale. And what about this one? I really liked using the GIS. The part I most enjoyed was getting to explore the map. It's giving the students the ability to own their own learning. Um, there is not much ownership of learning in that. That is exam friendly. It gives them what they need for the exam, but that is not a good experience of geography. Look at this. To explore the map, because I think it was cool how we could explore the damage that happened and the place that it happened in. It's almost like I fed them the line. I promise I didn't. <laughs> it was very interesting. Now, those are the students' words themselves, and to take that, to give the space a real sense of place through their ability to explore this GIS map. Another way that we can turn space into place is through another one of those core elements of geography, and that is fieldwork. Geography is a spatially contextualized subject. We don't just study rivers in general, we study particular rivers, and especially with the GCSE and AS uh, specifications with CCEA, we get a chance to go out into the field and to collect some data, and very often it'll be in the form of some rivers fieldwork. So what role can GIS play in the fieldwork aspects of geography? ArcGIS has some other software called Survey123, which is a data collection app that can be run off your phone and will allow you to collect primary data and crucially to geotag it. Now the first time I heard about it was an event uh, run by Esri Ireland up in Belfast introducing GIS and as I sat in the um, event itself um, this really fired off some ideas for me because as I mentioned earlier on I'm in charge of shared education um, and as I discovered that there was this phone app that could geotag and some pupil data, I thought to myself, now I wonder could I get students from my school and our partner school to travel around the town of Lurgan and to do a survey with them about their perceptions of place. And I wonder could we explore what they think about that. And that for me was this dialogue going on here. I at that stage had no idea of the know-how. I didn't know how to make this work, but knowing what the, the um, software could do, knowing that it could do that, and knowing what I wanted to achieve, the know why fed me into the idea. And lo and behold, a few months later, having got some support and training from Esri, we had the students out and about doing this survey and went extremely well. In fact, we were incredibly honoured to be invited over to the Esri User Conference in July in 2019 in San Diego to be the first schools from outside of the United States of America to present at their user conference in front of 19,000 people about the work that we'd been doing using this GIS software in Lurgan. And we had three of our own students on the stage presenting there and doing us all incredibly proud. I could talk easily for all my time and more about all that we've achieved through that. But let me just show you a, a video of the day so that you can get a bit of a sense of the software in action. Lurgan itself is quite a divided town uh, and has become more so even since the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process has begun. Uh, and very often the young people in the town don't actually just get an opportunity to meet. So the essence of the shared education programme is to creating that opportunity. In this particular project, it's been important to allow the children to see 
how they feel in different spaces in the town, right from the extremes of you know um, what's traditionally a Protestant background or what's maybe a Catholic background towards the more shared spaces in the town, and allow them to see how they feel and how each other feels in those different spaces. <laughs> I'm feeling quite comfortable at the chapel here. I'm feeling okay, I'm feeling grand, just it's afternoon time in the housing state. At 10pm on Saturday night I would feel mm, not really, feel uncomfortable either. I would say I do feel comfortable in my town but I think that's just because I'm always in my like area of like the divide, I never really am in the other side of town. There's not that many no-go areas in town. I wouldn't consider any areas that I wouldn't go to in Lurgan. Maybe it would feel a little bit more uncomfortable around certain times of the year. Places I wouldn't feel comfortable would probably be down the road in this housing state, down in a Kilwilkie area. More of the IRA memorials and the murals and all that there I wouldn't feel entirely safe there. There's definitely a few that I wouldn't want to be at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night, like I think park, I would never want to be there alone. We hope to achieve with this project that the pupils will be able to see as they went round today and we've taken the survey that there is across the board a variation of how they feel at the different places and to identify that it's okay that in certain parts some people may feel uncomfortable, but when they identify that, to actually start to make steps forward and going, right, how do we change this? How do we make a difference? If I had to change anything, it would definitely have to be taking down flags. I'd like my town to be more uh, inclusive and everyone being able to tolerate each other. What I would like to see in my town is a bit more unity. There is still a wee bit of a divide and it's just not needed. It's been an eye-opener, really. I'm um, just seeing how people felt. Uh, where I felt comfortable and how they felt. It's been very positive and it's good to hear different people's opinions on different places in town. Enjoyed it. Um, it's been fun. It's nice mixing with it with the other school. I think it's just a good way to like bond with people. Being involved in this survey is all about creating that opportunity for them to have a different narrative when they're growing up, so that their experience growing up even in a, a town in a society that's still divided, is one where they are interacting, where they're meeting, where they're doing so from a young enough age that it forms their attitudes and experiences early on. When you give them that opportunity to meet, uh, as we've seen today yet again, they just get on really, really well. And it's really just about creating those chances and then letting the young people do what they will do, which is just hang out and chat and make friends. The second example of fieldwork that I'll look at will be our good friend, the Cullen River in Belfast. Well, I can't do a presentation about GIS and uh, for geography in schools without mentioning rivers somewhere. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, will actually use the Cullen River for your GCSE fieldwork experience, or even if you don't, have used some of the others uh, in Northern Ireland, this will give you a bit of a sense of how we can use this. Now, I use it as part of the planning. I'm not going to go into that in a huge part of detail today, but uh, I'll show you how we can and use this to look at how the land use varies around it and various bookmarks that they can go to up towards the source and things like that. We can also look at the geology of it, which is a very interesting one because the geology changes considerably as the Collin River moves down through the Collin Glen. Any of you who do your field work here will know this. But what I want to do is to show you how this can be used to present the data that you've collected. Um, we're not going to be going out with our year 11s this year, I would imagine to carry out fieldwork as a social distancing. But our year 11s last year used Survey123 to collect the data and I've managed to get some of that data on here for you. So if I zoom in a little bit to the section of the Collin River that we investigate, we start here up in the source and then we come down in here into the Collin Glen. And I can turn on this fieldwork data which can show you where that um, data is located. So you can see the survey points that we went to up near the source. Um, and you can see how this is used as a presentational tool. Now, in the exam, of course, we've got to draw the graph, but I think this is an equally valid way of presenting it. And then if anything, it actually spatially contextualizes it even better for them. But because this is GIS, you can have a lot of extra information in with the circles that are presented here, because I've got not only the um, 
depth, which I think is the one that's presenting there, but we've got the, the width, you've got the average depth, you've got the description here and the velocity. And for each one of these points, we have got this information. And what they can do is to go and collect that information there and interrogate it and go and have a look at it and see what is presented. And it's also, um, we like to get them to use the photograph function here, uh, take a photograph supposedly of the river itself, but of course they like to take photographs of themselves posing in it, don't they? So that is presenting the data here, and it is, to me, a very, very legitimate way of presenting it. You can use this alongside a graph, but that's an incredible data presentation tool. That's not the only way you can present this data. Let me show you what else you can do with it. I showed you at the start of this presentation how ArcGIS can represent information not just in 2D maps but in 3D interactive landscapes and that you can take the data that you've collected through Survey123 and you can put it into this, it's called a scene and you can really contextualise the data into the particular landscape itself. Uh, when we collected this data with our students, we brought them back in uh, again to class, and, and of course we've got to train them how to do the hand-drawn graphs for the exam. And no matter how many times you say to them, I'm sure you have the same experience as well, that uh, along the bottom you're not just putting survey sites, you're putting distance from the source. So I told them that and then let them have a go to see how many in the class would actually get this right. Most of them did, but there was a small but sizable minority that had the gap between all of the survey points exactly the same. They didn't put distance from the source, they just did survey science. Now what that shows me is that as they're sitting in my classroom, they have actually managed to disconnect the fact that the survey sites weren't um, equidistant, that there were different distances between them. They've managed to, in other words, decontextualize the data from the landscape. It just becomes a table of numbers and I'm plotting this on a graph in the same way that I would plot a graph in science after my experiment. But what if we present it like this? I still remember the first time that I showed this to my students when we went from the 2D map to this one. I had literal gasps around the classroom as they realized what they were about to see and I demoed them this. So there's the source and then we can look downstream with this and then we can spin around and go down to some of the other survey points and look back up at where we've come from. This is survey point two and we can get a real sense of the distance and there's the Colin Glen that we've been walking down through. Let's go down to the next one. And this so contextualizes this in space and we remember that the Colin River is surrounded by urban areas. And of course this being GIS, any one of those contains all of the information that you've collected, including those wonderful photographs with the students posing in them. But this is absolutely turning space into place and it's bringing to life this data in a way that otherwise just simply would not be possible. And for them to interrogate this, to move around, to sweep around and crash into the hillside, um, they can really just get a sense of this particular particular river in this particular location and they can see through this what they would not otherwise be able to see. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed that very brief overview and introduction to just some of the things that we're doing with GIS with our geography students in Lurken College. Uh, we could talk uh, about the benefits of GIS, the fun and the engagement level with it, how it opens up their eyes to the future careers prospects through geography, all of which are important. But at the heart of this, the reason why we do it is because it helps them to do their geography better. As the title says here, it's unleashing their geographical vision. It's letting them see things about the world that without the GIS they would really struggle to see otherwise. And that's why I'm using it and that's why it's important. Now, I'm very interested in exploring um, some live webinars for geography teachers to take this a little bit further and find out how you might be uh, in, or begin to use GIS within your teaching. If that's something that you're interested in, please do get in touch with me. You'll see my Twitter um, address there, at LC Geography. It's the easiest way to get in touch with me. Do reach out, get in touch, and let me know if that would be something you would be interested in, because I certainly would be very keen to help. In the meantime, thank you very much for your time today. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I'll be around in the panel discussion later on. So if you have any questions, just fire them at me 
and I'll do my best to help them. Thanks very much. <laughs>